Wednesday, let's chat. I'm Kanan Chandran, the publisher of StormAsia.com, and today we talk about something that is in everybody's mind. It's lunchtime. It's in something to get into your stomachs. It's about food. Um, it was World Food Day on Saturday, uh, 16th of October. Not sure how many people out there realize that, because every day is food day as far as we are concerned. We need to eat to live. And it's a challenge when you have to try and do all of that uh, as a supplier of food for the population, as a supplier of food for consumers, as a producer of food. Um, you have different levels of society involved in this. You have the well-heeled who, who dine at swish places. You have the man on the street who maybe likes a hawker fare. And you have people who are desperately trying to put meals together. And how do we support those people? Today's discussion is on food security and food uh, sustainability. I mean, the World Food Summit of 1996 defined uh, food security as when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. Right? Now, food insecurity would be trying to find all these things uh, and live up to that definition. And I think it is a it's an increasingly difficult challenge to, to manage for various reasons, right? Uh, we've got climate change as something to consider. We've got the rural to urban shift that's taking place, making it difficult for people to grow produce. It's a viability of getting into that whole space of growing and developing food. Um, and are, things, are our methods sustainable? Are organizations sustainable? And now, of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, how is that going to affect all of us? So we've got viewpoints from three very distinct uh, areas in today's discussion. And let me just quickly introduce the panelists today. Uh, we've got Desmond Chow, who is the founder of Singapore Crawfish. Uh, Desmond is a university lecturer turned crawfish farmer who discovered a good sustainable business model as a result of a class research project uh, for his students. After nine months of research, he was convinced that crawfish is one of the most profitable livestock to, uh, to rear and sell uh, and an alternative food source for the future. Uh, he opened his first farm uh, in 2018 at Sungai Tengah uh, and Singapore Crawfish has uh, invented a proprietary hatchery technique that is being exported to other markets. We've got Kenny. Kenny Eng is the director of Garden Asia and E4 uh, Group. Um, he's a fourth generation business owner, uh, a farmer, uh, who lives by the motto, no farmer, no food. Uh, the rising concerns over Singapore's food security and sustainability issues uh, propelled Kenny to channel his focus on drumming up support for local farms through the local farm brand. Sim Bihya, CEO of Food from the Heart. Uh, food from the Heart is a charity with 90 points island-wide where you distribute food to the needy families. Uh, something like uh, 10,000 bags uh, given out uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, Bihar has a lot of experience in non-profit and government organizations. And for her dedication to community service, she was conferred the Public Service Star and the Public Service Medal. How accurate is that definition of food uh, sustainability and food security for each of your organizations? Because you approach it from different directions. So From the Heart is a charity that is 18 years old. We are coming of age. Uh, but in all, in the entire history, sustainable giving has always been something that we adhere to. So today we give to this particular family. We want to continue to give until the family is out of the uh, poverty cycle. So sustainable to us is really about ensuring that the charity continue to be able to operate, continue to be able to serve the beneficiaries we serve until they are out of the cycle. Food insecurity um, it's a much more complex issue. It is not a one-dimensional thing where everybody understands it to be that someone is food insecure. 
um, COVID has shown us that there is always temporary food insecurity. People who are just um, you know, in need of food support for a short time before they get back on their feet. Then you have so-called the chronic or the permanent food insecure, um, the elderly, unemployed, ill health. Um, they'll probably get out of the cycle only when they pass on. Then you have the generational food insecurity. You know, um, the parents are not doing well, the children are suffering, um, and you probably got to wait until the children finishes their education and then they're out of the cycle. So there's generational um, food insecurity. And sometimes it's quite sad, you do see them probably going to get out of the cycle only in the third generation, um, because you look at the second generation, it's a vicious cycle, right? So for us, food insecure is really about, um, uh, as a food charity, we try to fill the gap. Uh, we try to actually be able to feed uh, the hungry, needy. Um, so we are also now looking at, you know, um, enhanced giving, giving better uh, so that you know, people donate right so that we can give better because we rely on, uh, we raise funds, we raise food. So food donated to rest will go out um, to the beneficiaries. So if the food donated is not right, then what, what we give would not be right. So um, that is what we've been moving towards. We've also moved towards digitalization so that we can also give a voice to beneficiaries, understanding, you know, when they consume, what they consume. Um, and that will help us to understand them because I think beneficiaries, especially for the food insecure, they tend to be a little bit shy about coming forward and sharing um, what they need um, or telling people what they don't want because there's always the stigmatization. They're also worried they may be blacklisted by well-intended you know, volunteers. So having data, knowing what they eat, when they eat, what they eat, um, you know, will help us to actually chart future directions to fill the gap of the food insecure. So I think food sustainability and uh, food security, it's often uh, two words that you can hear them coming together, but they are actually quite different uh, in terms of their, their own, right? So if we start with food sustainability, the word sustainability means um, have ability to having it sustained for uh, extended periods of time. So we can talk about um, growth methods or even uh, logistical methods, logistical supply chains, right? Whether the farmers are getting paid um, equally or fairly, um, right down to what kind of crops do you grow? So for example, right? Um, we talk about the FCR is something very common in the farming industry. Um, FCR stands for feed conversion ratio. So how much feed do you need to feed uh, an animal to convert it to uh, the amount of meat. So for example, the FCR for cows is actually eight, which means that you need to feed a cow eight kilos of feed in order to get one kilo of beef, right? The FCR for a lot of marine fishes um, stands around one, 1. 1.8 to 2.4. Um, so that literally means that you have to feed fishes 2.4 kilos of feed in order to get one kilo of fish. Right. So um, when you think about that, it's literally exchanging small fish to feed a big fish and that you get a more valuable fish. So this, in, in a sense, it's not really sustainable. So another thing about sustainability is also um, harvesting and its methods. Right. So that's why governments are banning overfishing, over harvesting. Um, how is that so? So in the past where technologies were not that advanced, Farmers or fishermen would have would fish 50% or harvest 50% and 50% is left to reproduce. But today with the advancements of technologies, farmers or fishermen, they harvest 90% and only 10% is left to reproduce, which is extremely unsustainable. So that's why we talk about food sustainability. What are the methods? What are the technologies uh, that can be input into farming? to make sure it's sustainable. Then we talk about food security. So food security, uh, the word security basically says it all, right? So as Singapore, as a country, you know, how can we provide enough food for our people, right? Um, I'm sure everybody knows that Singapore imports most of its food products from our neighboring countries. So what happens in the event uh, where the pandemic worsens and 
the food supply from our neighboring countries stops. I, I would like to simplify food a little. Uh, I'm a fourth generation farmer, uh, but I'm in the horticulture industry. We are part of Nifo Garden Asia and the local farm was a brand that we created about two years ago. Just nice, just before COVID started. Uh, and COVID kind of propelled the brand further because I think it was just timely at the point in time. But let me just look at it from a very layman perspective. Farmers are just like any other entrepreneurs. Right? Their objective is to make profits, to grow the business, to get talents, you name them, right? from your HR to your finance, to your strategy, to your technology. We are no different from any other uh, you know, companies in the world. Unfortunately, farmers have this stigma that, oh, you're a farmer, so you have to do that. You just have to produce food. So one of the, after serving the community, so I was serving the farming community for more than 15 years, and I met up with a lot of farmers around the world. One of the common understanding I had is that, you know, no farmers, no food, because even a farmer in South Africa, young farmer tells me his biggest concern is to attract young people to join him. When I say no farmers, no food, in terms of food security and food sustainability, I think it kind of encompasses everything. Farmers at the end of the day need to be sustainable. All right? And in Singapore, where we import 90%, Right, where food itself at this present moment, only eggs is at 28%, you know, fish is 8%, and our vegetables is at 13%. We still have a long way to reach our 30-30 strategy, which is in year 2030, we will achieve our 30% nutritional needs. Uh, we, it's not just as simple as producing it. My question I always ask about food sustainability or food security is this. Okay, So if every one of you here today the farmers are really solid. We decided to adopt technology. We continue to grow food. We achieve the 2030 dream, right? Finally, Singapore can produce 30% of our needs. Now, my next question is, who's going to buy? There you are. Coffee shop is downstairs. Supermarket is next to you. And our government has been sharing with everybody that don't worry, we have enough stockpile for everybody. There is no urge for any one of you to say, let's go and buy a local produce. Then what's going to happen to the farmers then? Think about it in this scenario. My fear is that the farmers have no incentive to grow more food. Thus, the local farm when we started uh, two years ago, I knew that we had to create a disruption to and try to come up with different experiences to let people buy local and not just support local. Because support is easy. Buying is the key crux of everything. So, so that's how I see it. I think COVID has kind of like propelled the food security into a different light. Uh, everyone is talking about it. Everybody realized the need to, to really realize the support. Just like today itself, uh, my egg farmer itself is supposed to deliver the eggs to our grocer, to our f &B outlet, which is in our farm. Uh, and uh, they delayed by two hours. Guess what happened? COVID. To who? The drivers. Oh. You know, so the situation is real. The disruption is real. When COVID hit Singapore itself last year, um, one of the things that we noticed is that money can't buy food. So what we are rich as a country where the disruption hot around the world, no food can come into Singapore, no food will come. So I think it's a, a way of resetting the way we look at food and to simplify it, I think we have to relook into it. Singapore produced food in the 60s. We export pork. We are 104% in pork, all right? And 100% in eggs, vegetables, etc. Today, 50 over years later, less than 1% of our land is left for agriculture. So it comes at a great expense. But is it wrong? I don't think it's wrong, right? It's, yeah, we are a small nation. We are a small little island. We need to develop ourselves, grow ourselves to be who we are. We are the beneficiary, especially a younger generation. We benefited from all our forefathers, all the hard work that they put in. But I think maybe it's time for us to relook into what we have forgotten or forsaken and see how we can actually bring it back again. Yeah. Is, is that something which uh, would be really uh, accepted by people? I think, you know, Kenny, what you just said about bringing it back, being, bringing farming back. Uh, Desmond, in some way, you are trying to do that as well, right? You're yeah, starting a new thing, you're, you're creating <laughs> young farmers, yeah. opportunities, young farmers. Yeah. But is the mindset here geared towards that? Or do you still want to, you know, go for the comfort of a nice office job or work from home in this case? Uh, mm -hmm and not get your hands dirty. I think it's the mindset or rather changing the mindset and educating the younger generation, right? So uh, most of the younger generation, they have this mindset that said, um, farmers are poor. You can't make money from, you can't make money 
from farming, right? And that's because uh, the previous generation um, during the, the 70s, the 80s, they have uh, inculcated this mindset that, hey, you know, when, when you grow up, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, you should be an engineer, accountant. You know, no, no parent would tell their children, hey, I want you to grow up to be a farmer, right? Because they think that, hey, you know, farming is poor and, poor and, 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 and things like that. So that might be true. That might be true in the past, you know, where farmers were uneducated and um, most of the profits were made by the traders, the middlemen who take a huge chunk of profits, you know, buy cheap from the farmer, sell expensive to consumers. But where with technology, with education these days, farmers are very, very well educated and they can go directly from farm to table. So this is something that I want to share with the younger generation, right? That it is, it's different from the past now. It's extremely profitable to get into farming and farming is the next big thing. So why do I say farming is the next big thing? Everybody knows that the global population is rising, right? But if we look around at our friends, you know, when, when I was lecturing, often I asked my students, you know, how many friends do you know? My students are on Facebook, they have thousands of friends. But when I ask them this question, how many friends do you know who are farmers? Very often the answer comes out zero or one, right? And if we look at our current farmers today, where majority of our farmers are from the previous generations who are in their 60s, who are in their 70s. So imagine this in 10 years time, when these farmers retire, who's going to farm food for the next generation, right? So food is cash, right? You can have the, the best engineers, you can have the best financial products or AI technologies, blah, 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 blah. But you need food to survive. So that's our primary need. But uh, to put things in perspective today, what we have noticed in the past five years is that there is a growing ground up initiative by younger generation who are more educated, who believe where the food comes from, who understand sustainability, climate change is the way to go. They are the ones that are coming out for, to, to the farming scene and start dabbling themselves, getting their hands dirty, uh, believing that this is the way to go. Uh, but of course, it comes with a price. What's the price? The ecosystem at this present juncture is not robust enough. So many people tend to face different challenges as they go in, and some of them get burned out in the initial years, right? That they are so passionate about getting things done, but people are just not supportive uh, in the ecosystem. Um, what is the change that we saw in these two years of COVID? Huge changes. Suddenly, the whole Singapore is talking about food. Everybody feels that it's so important to be secured. And you know, agencies are putting in their top thinking process, getting all the perspective from productions to ecosystem to be in place. Schools, for the matter, you'd be surprised. I mean, I've been invited countless times to, to give talks and you know, to several schools from secondary schools all the way to IHLs. Everybody now today, even in their curriculum, in their studies, are talking about local produce. So I think looking forward, it will still take at least another generation or two. Let's, let's not think that oh, just because, uh, because now everybody's talking about food and within like, two years time, everybody will say, parents will say, well done, be a farmer tomorrow. Or maybe do a direct uh, DSA, direct to because I'm a farmer, so I can go DSA to another better secondary school or primary school or something. You know? it, it doesn't work that way, right? So it takes a whole ecosystem to be robust. And let's not complicate it. As what I always say, at the end of the day, food is being produced by humans or sometimes can be technology, but you still need human touch to everything, right? So if the farmers have no incentive to grow food, frankly, you have to worry that there'll be no food on your table one day. In the Singapore context, right, uh, do, are there incentives uh, given to farmers to continue with the work that they're doing? The Singapore Food Agency, which is the agency that's taking care of all the farming community, um, they, they don't subsidize the way other countries are doing, all right? So uh, we don't. But I think they support farmers in many, many different sectors uh, in terms of uh, implementation of technology, grants for them to expand their business as long as they fall into the category that, and of course, their checklist that they have. So fish, eggs, and vegetables are the three core food that they are dabbling into it right now. And they are ramping up the production as we talk about. Uh, millions of dollars has been dispersed 
uh, to different stakeholders that are interested to be part of this ecosystem. I think, but that that is a part that Singapore Food Agency is doing. Yeah. So, but on the ground itself, we, there is still a gap, a gap between uh, producing food and for for people to eat and and buy and and you know and or producing food in terms of just tech. You know, so my fear itself is that it's a very thin line right now because if food cannot make money, it's only natural for the business to sell tech. I have a fabulous technology. So if everybody just want to sell tech or grow food that makes money, then what about the staple? So, so this is a very uh, interesting topic to this, for discussion because it's, there's no one answer for all. all right? It takes a lot of people to come together to get this right. Yeah. And in all of this, you also see wastage uh, taking place, despite the fact we import ninety percent of what we uh, what we consume. Food wastage, right? Is it happens at different stage of the of the supply chain, um, and and really for a food charity, we also there are there is food um, wastage that we can directly give up as food um, to our needy. But there is also a huge portion that these two particular pillars do not meet. So, for example, we do not take near expired food um, and give to beneficiaries because by the time they get it, it might be expired. Uh, but we do have two programs where we um, are part of the process of minimizing food waste. One is the Bread Run program. That's how Food from the Heart started. Uh, Austrian couple, Christine and Henry Limer. They write an article about bakery throwing away the unsold bread at the end of a business day. So we even today, 18 years later, we still have a team of bread runners who will go and collect such unsold bread and then redistribute it out to our vaccinated receiving parties like homes, uh, our partners. Um, we also collect from um, fair price um, damage um, items, packaging damage items, where we will then check that they are all right to, for consumption and it will go out. Um, but you know, if you have, say, 10 pallets of yogurt drinks, you know, that's going to expire in two, three days, there's no way we can take that to feed the needy because that may not feed the diet as well. So for us, minimizing food waste occurs at different points in the supply chain. So at the retail part of it, it's only a small part of food wastage. Uh, Nationwide, the numbers, I think, is 600 over 1,000 tons. Um, but if you look at the numbers over the years, I think that number is still huge, but I think it is dropping. Um, so, you know, there's always this um, uh, dilemma that we have. Like, for example, COVID last year, there's no mines events. So, hotels are not, um, they don't have that much bread for us to collect. Um, bakeries are shut during circuit breaker, so we don't have bread to collect. So our bread collection actually dropped by almost 50% um, in, in, in just that um, few months of circuit breaker. But on the other hand, we should be happy that there's no food wasted. You know, and, and because the hotels and even bakeries are not very careful measuring how much they should bake, how much they should prepare. And therefore, your food wastage actually has sort of come down. Um, it's whether can we keep that up in a sustainable manner um, you know, when, when Jessa Kenny was mentioning about, um, you know, um, uh, whether people will buy the food. Uh, for example, you know, when we give out food pack, um, where, where we give out items for them to cook, right? So they may be canned items, but, you know, we assume that people cook. Uh, but there's a, a huge portion of people who don't cook, the needy who don't cook. And that's why we have Project Blanja where they go and buy and redeem their meals from the hawker center. So the lifestyle is a little bit different. I mean, for me, I'm a single. I don't cook at home. My fridge is basically quite empty. So, you know, uh, I wouldn't be a very good customer to the local farm because I would be consuming by buying from a hawker store, right? So I, I, I think lifestyle, stigmatization, perceptions, I think these are real hurdles uh, that we have to really take, look at it from a very wholesome picture. I, I do agree definitely that during COVID, there's a lot of conversations about food, about food insecurity, about feeding the needy. 
um, it is very real and the conversation is, is a good point to start so that people are aware that, you know, there is still a group of people in Singapore, in affluent Singapore, who actually needs help. As a food charity, we, good, we do get asked, uh, are you sure there's poor people in Singapore? Are you sure there's hungry people in Singapore? You walk downstairs as a coffee shop, you mean they cannot afford $3 chicken rice? Okay, we, we always get those kinds of questions. And we also get asked, you know, your, your canned food, you should not be giving out canned food, high sodium. You should not be giving out instant noodles, not, not nutrition, right? But what went off the shelves during hoarding when Doscon became orange was your canned food and your instant noodles, right? So, so it's, it's a, the conversations are very interesting because um, there's different perspective and, and there's no right or wrong. Um, it's just about talking about it and being aware of it. And, and today's session would actually create the awareness, you know, of, of what matters to everyone. Food represents different things to different people. Yeah. The, the, how many um, households are you helping out uh, with Food from the Heart? And did you see that? Do you see the number growing over time? Uh, yes, it grew. Uh, in 2019, we ended the year. Um, our food pack programs, community food pack and school goodie bag, we, we partner different people and the nature of the bag is a little bit different. Um, we were packing about 6,300 bags um, in December 2019 and came COVID, we, we just exponentially grew. Um, and by July last year, we were packing 8,000 plus. Um, and by this year, now we are packing 10,000 to 300 bags every single month which means this is a household because every household gets a pack. So mm. that's about 10,000 over households. So we, we know who they are. We work with our partners um, and we do, we have curated bags. Like for example, we work with NKF. Um, so there's are dialysis patients, renal patients. The bag contents of the bag is curated with the nutritionist with NKF. But can we curate 10,000 over bags? No. So we have family packs, we have um, elderly packs, we have you know curated packs for NKF. So the, the number of families are growing, the profile has also changed slightly. So last year during circuit breaker month, we have a lot of um, uh, short-term temporary cases, loss of income, loss of jobs, and then they find a job in another sector um, and, and they you know they say that maybe your back can go to someone else in need. So we, we are feeding a lot of people. In fact, in 2020, um, we distributed $6.53 million worth of food to about 53,000 unique hit counts. Wow. That's a sad indication to some extent of Singapore. The perception of Singapore is that it's a very affluent country, everybody's doing well. But the reality is that there is still a lot of poor, and it's a growing number, which is a bit difficult to take, right? For a lot of people, I think. Um, as farmers, do you see then? an opportunity to reach out to these people to maybe get into your farming communities to help help themselves. Yeah. Is that I, an avenue that you could take? I think I, I, I really uh, can understand and, you know, whatever that Bihar have shared is real, right? I mean, uh, so what happened was that when we started the local farm, our purpose was to really support the farmers, to ensure that they continue growing food, right? And to make sure that they are able to sustain their business, uh, there is uh, interesting or in, important or increasing uh, demand for them as well. So this year, we actually started a pack called Farm Pack. So we did subscription pack. That, that's how we started during COVID. So we started the subscription pack for people to buy for a good three months. Every week, I deliver to your home eggs, fish and vegetables, plus some salads. Uh, we, we rotate it so that you can actually do that. But that background is this. We are trying to support the farmers by doing contract with the farmers so that we give them a fair price, we pay them in advance so that they can continue to grow food for us. That's our strategy. Mm -hmm. And Singaporeans in general, you have a choice. You can buy from web markets, supermarkets, or even Red Mart or all the online platforms that's available. You have no shortage of choices. But one of the key things that we notice is that the number of people subscribing to our pack keep dropping when COVID gets better or become normalized. Mm -hmm. All right, so we, we, we find that wow, this is going to be tough because we knew that it was tough because we launched several or such packs uh, several years ago, but we failed, all right? So this time around during COVID, despite that we're trying to do it, we also find that people are still not supportive enough 
to, to literally want to help the farmers in, in a much bigger manner. But thankfully, we started to dabble into something different. You know, corporate started to say, hey, you know what? I don't mind buying your pack, but I want to deliver this to a low-income family. So that triggered us beginning of the year to create a new pack called Farm Pack for a Cause. And within 10 days, we managed to get 52 SMEs on board to deliver 75 families a weekly of the pack that we deliver to any homes all right, that purchase from us. We deliver it to the loan. We work with the Ministry of Social and Family Development, MSF. They started this thing called Comlink, where they, it's like one stop for all uh, families to come by. If you, because last time, any of the low-income family, they have, uh, uh, for example, they have food issues, bursary issues, uh, education issues, or sometimes they even have work issues. So Comlink actually was being started and it was a brainchild of uh, Minister Desmond Lee, uh, where he wanted to make it easy for everybody as a one-stop. So it was created. So we worked with them. Uh, when we supported the families itself, you know, it was really heartening. Uh, months later, we received a note from one of the children who, who have been receiving the pack and thanking the donors for giving them fresh produce to eat. Uh, you know, it was really by chance that we dabbled into this space. Right. Our objective was always farmers first. You know, then we realized that on the other hand, when we deliver the pack to a family that have uh, bought from us on three months, they will come to us and say, oh, my grandchildren don't like quail egg. Can you change the eggs? Uh, your vegetables, can you keep on uh, giving me uh, maybe some pie chai instead of kang kong? You know, there's so many of varieties and options that everybody has. But there it is. I deliver the same freshness. They are not old. They are good, fresh from the farm given to the low-income family, they, they appreciate it most because they can't even afford to buy it. They may say why they can't afford to buy a $2 tang kong or a chai sim. It's just that they can't feed them well. You know, huh? you know they have a family of four in their family. What can they do? So I, I really feel that there is a lot more that we can do. All right? uh, even for farms, I think for me to bring farmers to support the low-income family, uh, it was really a blessing in disguise for us during COVID. And uh, we are hope that we can do more in this context and get more Singaporeans on board. All right. And I think this is a good fit because like it or not, we only produce not more than 20%. Mm. I think I, I'm but... sure there will be a synergy with uh Kenny. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, for us, because we have access to this needy families sure. through our different programs. So I think for um a charity to work with a farm, a local farm, would be something that is, you know, I'm sure there'll be synergies, even yeah. with Desmond, maybe we can get a bit of a <laughs> sure, sure. No yeah, problem. No problem. yeah, so I, I agree with uh Kenny and uh, Lee here, but what what most of what both of them are talking about is more towards uh microeconomy. But when we when we look at macroeconomy, right, one of the more important things is to look at the sustainability, which was the first topic that we that we spoken about. It's it's very important to be sustainable, where I mean what we here and Kenny mentioned, it's more towards a uh, charity, all right, uh, helping the farmers. But at the end of the day, it's really how can how can the farmers benefit or can the farmers really profit from it from a macro perspective where we want to gather uh, more youngsters, the younger generation to come into farming, can we compete on a global level? Uh, one of the examples is that, you see, um, a lot of people have approached me and asked me, um, hey, Desmond, uh, I want to farm. I want to start farming in Singapore. You know, how can I do that? Uh, is it profitable for me to do that? Um, as much as I like to help them and I like to educate them, the answer is, Unless you have capital or you are a big company, it's very difficult for an individual to start, right? I mean, of course, the government, there are government initiatives where you can buy a small potted plant or a hydroponic setup, you know, and you go home and try to grow a few ball of lettuce. That is something very educational. But is it sustainable? Not really. And even a farm in Singapore, you know, um, especially the farming community in Singapore, we really need more support from the government. Um, why do I say so? You see, there's this thing in farming, uh, what we call ECR, energy conversion ratio, right? That means that how much energy, uh, light, aircon, fertilizer, manpower, space, rental, you need to put into it 
to grow a ball of lettuce, the cost of that ball of lettuce for vertical farming in Singapore could be two two dollars, two plus dollars, right? But when we import vegetables from our neighboring countries, it arrives at our doorstep, the cost could be a dollar, right? So for a layman, when you walk into NTUC and you see one dollar and two dollar, which is the obvious choice, right? So it's it's not just it's not just a hey, get into farming. It's interesting. It has a lot of layers to it where it incorporates a business aspect into it also. Not just farmers. I grow a seed today, and then you know um, it turns into a vegetable at, at the end of my harvest season. It requires a lot of business knowledge, right? To know exactly what kind of vegetables to grow, what kind of fish to grow, what is the capital that's involved. What are the skills that that's required? You know whether you are going for low tech farming, mid tech farming, or even high tech farming, right? Um, yeah. So I think that there are a lot of questions that needs to be explored. Um, and this industry, especially in Singapore, at this stage, it's it's a growing industry. I would say <laughs> you're being yeah. too kind as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think I I can understand where Desmond is coming from. Uh, but frankly, um. The assumption at the end of the day is about farmers are paid fair price. That's the assumption, right? Because if they are paid fairly, then of course they can make profits out of it. So um, even though when I was talking about farm pack, uh, the strategy that we adopt is very different. We contract farmer at a better price, ensure that they are actually able to do that. And because it's a subscription model, we are able to give them deposit before they even grow the food. So that will help them to change the way things are actually doing as well. But at the end of the day, who says farming is easy anyway? <laughs> who says going into business is easy? Nobody, right? So, so people shouldn't have the impression that it's easy. Nothing is easy, right? Business, to start up a business is not easy. To start a charity is worse. You know, there's so much of work that needs to be done. You can ask me here. There's so much of things that goes through, you know? So I think entrepreneurship is never about starting a business. It's about the spirit of being an entrepreneurship and whether you can sustain it, all right? You can actually go through it, uh, you know, and never see uh, failures as failures, but a lesson learned and you keep going. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's how I see things, yeah. Do you guys see um, the road for Singapore down the line? Do you see issues of uh, sustainability and insecurity with food uh, growing? During this COVID situation, a lot of people might think that, hey, uh, one of the biggest worries of governments all across the world is actually the pandemic, the COVID situation. Um, but from what we realize, right, uh, from ministerial meetings, we realize that food is actually the priority. Like governments, they are more, they are more concerned, you know, about hunger because hunger today kills more people than COVID. So just imagine this. Uh, of course, we know that in various countries, um, the COVID numbers reported daily are very high um, and we have sources telling us that you know these numbers might just be the city numbers right what about the people in the villages in the rural area and these people the numbers there are thousands of deaths that goes unreported right because they have no access to vaccines they have no access to ventilators etc and the worst thing is that these farmers these people are our farmers right so imagine when, when I mean, we always talk about 30, 30 times 30, which is quite a few years down the road. But just imagine right now, or rather six months down the road, when we realize that, hey, these farmers who used to produce food for us have all passed away because of COVID. So who's going to provide food for us in the next two years, right? So that that is, it's something very real, food security. It's not something that, um, like in the future, you know, we talk about 10 years later, 20 years later. No, it's actually very, very real. And it's it's almost at our doorstep. Kenny was mentioning about um, farmers, um, you know, paying them fairly. You know, as a food charity, we, we rely on food donations and we also raise funds to buy food. And whenever we engage partners, you know, um, suppliers, it has always been to pay fairly because then it is a long-term basis. Someone can give you and donate to you once, twice. Can they keep doing it? 
it's, it's not just a sustainable model. So we come back to sustainability as a charity. So we believe really in about paying market rate, pay it fairly. So even our partnership hawkers now, Project Blanja, we also pay the hawkers uh, fairly. We don't expect them to give us a 10% discount for every meal, no. Whichever meal that the beneficiary redeem, we pay in full. Last year at one stage, uh, we, we had to purchase a lot of food because we all food donation drive stock because people were working from home. Uh, schools were more concerned about keeping the students safe. So we, we were not having our usual food donation drive. We actually had to raise money, activate money to buy food. And like what can you say, you have money, you also can't get food. When we place our order for curry chicken, <laughs> the supplier told us, okay, I take note of your order, but I'm not sure when you are going to get your curry chicken. Because their priority was to fill up the shelves in the supermarket. So when you talk about um, where we are heading for Singapore, really for, for us as a food charity, when we look at a mic, uh, more micro level, uh, we opened our first community shop at Mountbatten on 8th of February last year, the day after Doscon became orange. On the eve, that evening, all the social media visuals came out, empty shelves, fair price, Sing Shong, all the supermarkets, right? And the next day when we stood there, looking at our shop with our shelves full of different types of flavors of canned food, instant noodle, rice. And the beneficiaries may not worry about fighting with everybody else for food in a, a big supermarket. That, that really made us, you know, uh, reinforce the, the role of a food charity to actually protect the beneficiaries that we serve against the bigger landscape of whatever the ups and downs of any, any uh, break in the supply chain. Even, even at the height of the circuit breaker, we work with 100 over partners, 40% of them shut. Family service centers, SAC, schools were shut. And from delivering to 30 plus 40 points, we had to deliver to 3,000 over households overnight. And, and that is our little supply chain. You know, we, we don't talk about the international, the macro kind of supply chain. That is the supply chain for food support. Um, and, and that is a small version of what Singapore is really facing because you talk about you have the money, you cannot buy the food, um, you rely on other people, you are so dependent. All our vulnerabilities just surfaced overnight to the whole world to see. So I, I do hope Singaporeans don't keep themselves as, as if you know, the whole world owes you a living. It, it doesn't. You, know? you just have to um, do what you need to but I, I do strongly believe that Singaporeans are a resilient lot. I think we will were, we were emerge much stronger knowing all these vulnerabilities, uh, but they are not going to go away overnight. It's not, not going to be solved overnight. Um, conversations have to be done. And, and beyond conversations, drastic action, mind, perception changing, the way we do things, we just have to change. 110 years ago, my great-grandpa planted trees. Nobody said he's cool. Today, corporate plant trees, you're saving the world. 110 years ago, he only used everything organic. Nothing was man-made. Man created fertilizer. Today, organic food is the way to go. So what I'm trying to say here itself is that 54 years ago, Singapore was the agriculture state. And in order to build us into a first world country, we sacrificed agriculture. One day, agriculture will come back to take over what is theirs. So I feel that it's just a visual cycle. All right. So if you ask me about future, I think now it's a top-down approach. The government is, I, I'm quite confident we have our food story and we're going to have our agriculture. We don't have hinterlands in Singapore. I mean, maybe some islands around us. Uh, you know, we have to relook into how we produce food yeah, and we have to embrace it as we develop. And I feel that the food story will be something that Singapore will be proud of one day. Uh, you, you need to think deeper about how we're going to manage our food supplies down the line. Um, maybe the existing plan needs to be uh, revisited, altered, shift, and you know, given different priorities perhaps in terms of what we need to do with our land. Um, but it's uh, it's still only a little bit of what's going on in terms of the whole picture of sustainability and security. Uh, significant enough issues that we need to tackle down the line. So um, thanks for, for the for the insights because I think it's, it's it's a bit disheartening perhaps to hear about the growing number of people that need 
help from the part of uh, Food from the Heart. And I don't know how many other agencies are also offering their own uh, as, uh, uh, you know, version of that support. So the numbers could probably be a lot bigger than, are a lot bigger than what you've said. Be here. Uh, but Desmond and Kenny, you know, keep, keep producing the stuff because we will need it. It's part of our food culture anyway, and maybe uh, what you guys do will become uh, an aspect of Singapore's food culture uh, and something to consider as a, a sort of a little diamond uh, in the rough at the moment. Mm -hmm.